We have to be unionized to survive, or the otherwise the whole entire community, not only the packing plant, but it's also any other outfit, but they, they would follow the same position. Everybody will work for minimum wages. In 69, the wage rate was excellent, so I applied because I was looking for money. What I got in return is much more than money. All of a sudden, the door opened to me from the senior employees. They walked bent over because their backs were sore. Their hands were gnarled. They began to tell me about the stories as to how I got the wage rate that attracted me there. And those were fascinating stories. September 1908. E.F. Swift is in Edmonton to open his new packing plant. He marvels at how exactly it reproduces his operations in Chicago right down to the conditions for the 250 workers. There was no heat on the killing beds. If you leaned against a pillar, you'd freeze to it. Your hands would be white with frost, and you couldn't wear gloves, so your hands would grow numb. And then, of course, there'd be accidents. You couldn't get by a 66th Street. There was all full of people. And this uh, young, small fellow came in there with glasses. Dave caught me. And he'd come up and he'd feel your muscles and feel your, feel your back. The leg would buy an animal. The whistle blew twice, five to seven. You got to get on the job. Seven o'clock, you got to be working. And you worked and worked till the boss told you to go for dinner. Sometime it was five after 12, sometime it was quarter after 12. Five to one, you were back again. And you went home when the boss told you to go home. There was no overtime. If you had a complaint, they solved it within a day. No problem, no problem at all, just tell them. They'll give you a pink slip, you went around and collected your money and you went down to the transit. Problem solved. April 1937. Mary is using the skills she learned on the line to make sandwiches. Along with other Swift's workers, she's on a sit-down strike in the plant. They want a half-day holiday on Saturdays and the end to indignities, like the timed bathroom break. Within days, she will be joined by the workers at Burns and Gainers, stopping the city's whole meat industry. September 1945. There are rumors of peace. Sarah has mixed feelings. Of course she wants the war to be over, but she also really likes her job in the meat plant. She's worried that when the boys come home, things will go back to the way they were, and she will be out of a job. I was a standards checker. The idea of the standards department was, was to pay a bonus to the people that exerted or the gangs that exerted extra energy and more and did more than the, what's considered normal. This was all time studied with a stopwatch. We were in a sense policemen too because the more production they got the more money their people would get and we weren't really popular in the plan because we were watching them fairly close. They had a union in the AFL it was local 78 but it was a very soft union. You'd get into a grievance and first thing you know, you think you've got it solved, and one of your guys says, well, we've got to look at it from the company's point of view. Well, then that was finished. The, the discussion was over. You lost. So then we wanted a, more of a militant union, so we went to the CIO. September 1947. Jane has just heard that all the Canada Packers and Burns workers will be joining them on the picket line. That means there will be almost no meat packing across the whole country. Jane realizes this is a first, a national strike by all the workers in one industry. It looks like she'll get her pay increase. 
Well, we were kind of concerned about these older guys that had been working there for 20, 30 years, you know. They didn't know how to read or write. We were concerned about them losing their jobs. But we made a mistake because when they went on picket line, on the picket, there was a quarter section around, two or three at a time, oh, a whole bunch of them, and they were carried canes, <laughs> pieces of poplar. I don't think I would have cared to try to get in, you know. When you eat good bacon, you know it's good bacon. But when you're buying bacon, how do you tell? You can't taste it, you can't judge by the aroma, you can't even hear it sizzle. There's only one other sure way of recognizing good bacon. Look for the Swift's Premium Oval on the package. Swift's Premium Bacon, you know it's good because we put our name on it. One of my brothers worked at Swift's and he brought an application home for me one evening and I filled it out and uh, the next uh, day I got called uh, to come to work. Uh, at that time in 1957 the meat industry was about the third highest pay in Edmonton and, and probably in the province. I was truck driver that summer in 53. When the job shut down I just phoned around, I phoned the plant. Those are my pay slips I had. When I started working here in uh, 1957 at Swift's, my salary was $1.49 an hour. It's ironic that uh, 40 years later, uh, I had an increase of salary exactly tenfold because my salary was $14.89. There was a real sense of family. The union was there to help them. A lot of those fellows would work like a dog, but they wouldn't say too much to their bosses because they were afraid. Where with the union, they could take it to management. I believed in the union from the day I walked in there, you know. When we started there, I had to buy my clothes. You have to wear white clothes. During our negotiations, we got down to pay half. And then finally, we got where the company was paying all the clothes for us. I started working for Swift in 1952. I was working on the loading dock. We used to hire the cars in the morning. You had to put ice in there. There used to be a high sauce in the back. They used to have a pond in the back of the plant where they made ice. You had a great big saw sawing, and they'd take it up this conveyor. The blocks were about three feet by three feet, and they'd come sailing down, and you got out of the way. Because if it ever hit you, that was the end of that. It's all the time been a constant battle with safety with, the, with any company that I work for. I was working the wiener peeler. There was a gentleman, he turned up the machine, so you had rejects coming and leakers, and so you throw one here and you throw another at the other, and you're trying to package this where normally two people did it. I was doing it by myself. I went to pile the boxes 12 to a case. I had four boxes by this time. I lifted, swung around, and that was it. My back just jarred. I couldn't get up, I couldn't do anything. This happened in April, and the end of June, I had no job. They waited until somebody got injured, critically injured, and then he would fix it. The guy just about lost his life on the kidney floor. One of the circular saw went out of proportion, and it just about got him. And luckily that he got away, but he got injured quite a bit. There was five plants in the city. It was Canada Packers on Park Road. You could have seen it from Burns, and then Burns, you could see Swiss, and then uh, Capital Packers was just uh, down the road on uh, Fort Road. I had a brother-in-law working at Canada Packers. Then my wife and uh, her sister worked at Swift's. At that time, you used to have chain bargaining right across the country. It wasn't each plant individually. All the plants met together with the unions and they negotiated a contract for everybody across the country. In the 66, Canada Packers was on strike. Canada Pack to settle the, the contract, and we get the uh, thing 20 cents in Greece. October 1966. Betty's feeling good about her pay increase. She likes her work, but she feels she earns her money. The packing house isn't an easy place to put in your days. 
You had the, the hog kill here, you had the beef kill here, all in one big room. It used to get so hot in there that uh, it was almost like instant sweat. You walked in and you, before you even started to work, you were sweating. By four o'clock, the clothing on all the employees in that department were soaking wet. The fresh beef hides would come down and you had to spread them out on a pile and salt them by hand. Well, there was a fella in there. He'd been there about 30 years. Your hands get wet from the blood and that. Well, he literally had no fingernails. The salt just ate the nails right off. You're carrying 250 to 350 pounds uh, quarters on your shoulder. Stuff where the shirt is uh, sewed together, well, it cut the skin right down that the nurse had to put the uh, women's codec pads to stop the blood flow. I was a shop steward in the tank house in the rendering department for six years. The tank house is where all the salvage, they were grind them and cook them. In my shop steward in time, was one guy who got mad on the foreman and they take off. It was a very good work um, and I was stuck with uh, the manager of time off there and uh, I says, look, I know he's quit, but I, this was on a Friday. I says, during the weekend, I'm going to visit this guy and see if I can convince him coming back. He's going to give all the seniority back or um, he says, if you can do that, I give him all the seniority back. So that's what I did. I went on the bacon line. You try and make a package nice, so when you go to the store, you look at that package and say, oh gee, you know, I did this bacon, I shingled it nicely. And then when you see it shingled, you know, just any old howl, and you thought, oh, well I know I didn't do that because I do better quality work than that. The vast majority of my fellow workers, it was like a United Nations. When we come in 75, or most of uh, us can uh, speak a little bit English, but after 79, most of them don't know English. So they come in here, they need the job right away. So they just give them a knife and a sharper and go to work. There was, uh a lot of people that would start couldn't speak any English and you'd basically help them along with their English as they did the job. So you'd have to just kind of point as to where you wanted him to fill the box. Me, it was actually the opposite. I'm from a Portuguese background. By the time I started at Swift, I couldn't speak almost any Portuguese. By working with a few fellows next to me, my Portuguese actually started to improve. What amazed me with all of these people um, the divisions that they may have with respect to their particular cultural background, when there would be a inequity, um, when there would be um, something that would be discriminatory uh, against one of them, they would pull together as a group. I can think of some major issues which occurred prior to the strike in 1974, and a lot of those dealt with equal treatment for women. While uh, more senior union executive members were away at negotiations, I recall receiving a call, and to put a little bit of pressure on the employer, they wished the entire plant to slow down. So I could walk into a department in front of management, and with just a signal, that entire department would wind down. Everyone knew what we were trying to achieve. Management was amazed at that. 1974. Alice is on her first picket line. She doesn't want to be here, but she feels it's necessary. She wants more equal treatment. Swift's uh, pattern was they did not believe in scabbing a plant. The issues that got resolved in the 74 strike were uh, the introduction of some language changes directed at equality and fairness in the workplace. Oops, a Swift's premium ham. The nicest thing about being people is you can eat Swift's premium ham, sugar cured and slow smoked. Its sweet smoked taste goes deep to the tender heart of the meat. Swift is the meat. Swift has the taste you hurry home in haste to eat, eat, eat. The tastiest ham. Swift's premium. October 1980. 
Peter Parklington is riding high on real estate. He's taken the money from a flipped condominium in Toronto and bought the Gainers plant on Edmonton's south side. He wants to develop the land for housing. He decides to move the operations to another building on less valuable land. But just one building isn't enough for the man who owns the Oilers. But the whole Canadian operation of Swifts, right from Toronto to Winnipeg, uh, Regina, Edmonton, and, and Vancouver, and then he decided to close the Gainers' original plant. When I first became a chief steward, uh, looking at the old files, I found years where there was only three and four grievances filed for an entire year. Well, after the Pockington era, you never had less than 100 grievances per year. We used to work like, uh, like a family. Whoever was in need a hand, they used to move, move it to the other guy, give him a hand, and that's it. And after that, there was not such a thing. You know? Over the years, we had control on the killing floor. The line can go so fast per hour. When Parkinson took over, that all changed. They had a chain that would speed the lines up and they crank her up. In poor cuts, we were doing about 2,300 hogs a day. And then after Pockington took over, they've got up to between five and 6,000. If you're doing one every three seconds. So at that speed, you hardly even have enough time to keep your knife sharp. If you're a nice doll, you just dig it in and go as quick as you can. Otherwise, you run into the guy beside you. You almost get hypnotized. I had a shoulder injury. The uh, tendon worked its way up in between the shoulder bone. So they had to cut a piece of my shoulder bone off so it could drop back down again. We had to pull these big loads that were up to 2,500 pounds manually with a Jeep. Well, that's when I hurt myself. When Parkington was there, he hired compensation specialists to cut down on his compensation bills. So he would try to get people to stay in the plant whether they were injured or not and, and say they had light duty. But in fact, a lot of it wasn't light duty. I didn't feel too comfortable when Parkington took over because there were holes in the loading dock. He didn't have money to repair and he was taking out lots of money every month out of the place. He was buying an aircraft when I was there, an Israeli jet, and a teletype machine would get sheets of paper eight, ten feet long describing this thing. He was doing really, really good. His production was up to eight million pounds a week, and he wants more. How much is more? What percentage of profit does this man anticipate? <laughs> By the time we got to 86, the average worker was so ticked off at the way they had been treated, the way they had been abused by management, that we couldn't have prevented a strike. Which side are you on? 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 The very first day, nobody knew what was going to happen. All of a sudden, we've seen these buses full of scabs coming towards the plant. Without anybody orchestrating them or anything, everybody just sat down, locked arms. And uh, it was emotional, like, to see everybody just pull together. And the buses didn't get in that day. I mean, it shows you what a union actually stands for, is people being united. And when you're united, nothing can hurt you, right? Most of the other strikes were always short. There was no scabs, no replacement workers, so basically normally they lasted four or six weeks, but their intent was to break the union. Eventually they were putting plywood on the windows, and uh, of course uh, when scabs are coming in to take your jobs, you're going to do whatever you can to try and stop them. Just think of yourself, if you're in a job for anywhere from 10 to 40 years, and they try to bring in busloads of people to take your job away. Would you not fight for it? We didn't go out to cause violence or anything. If he didn't try to get the scabs into the plant, there wouldn't have been any violence. Which side are you on? 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 During the strike, it was um, quite a deal because I figured the union guys were okay. They told me, Vince, don't take your car in because we can't control everybody. So I used to take my bike 
so anyway, one morning they called me into the corporate office, Peter and his crew, and uh, Vince, what did they do? Did they hit you? Did they hurt you? And I responded by saying, no, they said good morning to me. That's more than you people have done. But our numbers are growing, our families and friends, churches and community are with us to the end. Then we were boycotting. We were asking the public to, to come on side with us. The national boycott uh, was a tremendous success. And I've heard in uh, the labor community that it was probably the most successful boycott ever undertaken. Canada, maybe North America. Ready, sing, oink. Oink. Moo. Mm. Again. Oink! Oink! Moo! You! Why is it you say moo? It's that beef in me! October 1988. Don Getty recognizes that Peter Pocklington has become a liability. The man is mired in debt, and worse, he's sold Gretzky. So when Pocklington defaults on his loan payments, the Alberta government takes control of gainers. And when the government took over, the most of the departments got a new fellow in charge. Like, for instance, Ed Campbell had been in charge of the transportation department for years and years. I was in after I retired, and there was another fellow sitting in Ed's office. And I said, who's he? Oh, he's my boss. He's the new government appointee. I said, does he know anything, Ed? <laughs> Ed blushed, and he walked out of the office with me, and he said, Vince, he doesn't know a truck from a school bus. <laughs> and they paid them 100 grand or something a year. November 1993. Ralph Klein is pleased with himself. He's found someone to take over the Gainers plant. Of course, getting the government out of the business of business is costing taxpayers 22 million in contributions to the Burns company. And then when Burns took over, there was no more bargaining. They uh, came out and said the best that they could do is that they would give us another three-year wage freeze. Or that the plant would shut. When I started there in 1957, there was rumors that the plant was going to shut. The membership thought, well, let's give Burns a try, and they accepted the three-year wage freeze. When Burns came in and took over, it was pretty well hell right from the start. When they came over, they just kept speeding up the chain. It was a lot harder on the people. They would cut 650 hogs in an hour, and each hog has two feet. A lot of people uh, wound up with carpal tunnel. I had carpal tunnel done. They just refused to accept the tractor agreement. There was a lot of stuff that we would turn the chicken shit where it was things that just didn't make a lot of sense. Some guy forgot to put on his hairnet when he went back instead of telling the guy to put on his hairnet. I would get a written warning. The biggest, ugliest thing, I guess, was if you had to go to the washroom, you had to, they would deduct the time you went to the washroom off your checks. Well, if you're touching cold meat, then you've got to run to the washroom. But then they say, well, if you go too many times, they're, they're going to fire you and suspend you. They did suspend some people. Here's the most important word, a complete and total lack of respect for these working men and women. Complete. September 1996. Michael McCain has added another series of assets to his empire. Maple Leaf Foods has just bought a number of plants from Burns, including the old Gainers plant in Edmonton. Michael McCain comes from a notoriously anti-union family. Profit, uh, you know, is uh, number one. Uh, he had no uh, immediate experience himself in dealing with uh, unions. It was kind of uh, bully boy antics that he was uh, using. Bargaining then resumed in January of 1997. Maple Leaf saying we are going to get another two-year wage freeze or we're going to shut the plant. I mean, when you get threatened time and time and time again, that either accept this garbage or we're going to shut down. You get fed up with it. Even under threats of closure, we still got 
strike vote of 68 percent. We didn't exercise our strike vote because we had this national strategy and in Saskatoon on uh, November the 11th it was decided at that meeting that if the Burlington plant went out on strike we would serve strike notice in Edmonton. Michael McCain sent out a letter uh, saying that if there was a strike that the plant was closed. When the 17th of November come along we didn't have a contract we went out on strike and uh, a week later, he did live up to his promise that he was going to close the plant, and he did. Ralph Klein is finally ridding himself of the plant on 66th Street. It's been an embarrassment to still be in the meatpacking business, especially when your partner decides to put 800 people out of work, and then ships the plant's equipment out of the province. So Klein signs a tentative deal to bring in Fletcher's Meats. First, however, the old buildings must be torn down at government's expense. Was the other day I met a guy uh, which was worked there also many many years around 30 years or so and um, he said he had a job before which was paid $14 an hour and now he has he has to have three jobs to make up and uh, I told him he said still you don't uh, understand what this union is all about 